Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag where I answer your questions, your hot takes, your observations, and ultimately your comments about tennis or anything else. I posted on the YouTube community tab. You posted in my Discord community. Link is in the description. This is the 2024 post Wimbledon mega mailbag. Might be a little shorter than usual because I am kind of in a crunch this week with uh, commentary prep and content, trying to do both at the same time. Doable, very doable, but busy, busier than usual. Uh, but this is always the perfect way to wrap up Wimbledon prep, put a bow on everything, all of the burning questions that exist after Wimbledon. It's impossible to get to all of them, especially the bigger picture stuff, when uh, I'm doing my more granular match-by-match -match analysis and uh, a lot of big picture stuff on Alcaraz and Djokovic and stuff that we can get into, as well as some non-Alcaraz Djokovic stuff. Uh, but there are a lot of Alcaraz questions in particular, and I think that's really good. I think that's good because sometimes, again, when I'm zooming in on a match, I'm analyzing what happened in a singular match. Some of the some stuff can get lost, and the mailbag is when we can we can get into that stuff. So let's get into it. First one is from user. Hi, Gil. How would you rank how impressive Alcaraz's four major titles are, taking into account factors like significance, performance, and difficulty of opponents? Thanks, as always. Fun one to start us off. Fun one. I'd say number one is still Wimbledon 2023. Look, after that match, what I said was that's the win that doesn't happen and hasn't happened. You do not beat... Novak Djokovic, even at 36 years old, you don't beat Novak Djokovic in a Wimbledon final, especially not in five sets. It broke all the trends. It broke all the statistics. It is unlike anything we saw other than maybe Del Potro, U.S. Open 2009. So when you have that much history built up of young player against big three in major final, like dec multiple, like a decade and a half of history of Djokovic will win, Alcaraz will lose. When you reverse that and you do so in spectacular fashion against a Djokovic, uh, who, yes, made some mistakes in crucial moments, but played well for the most part, that's got to be number one. Number two, that's a tougher one to answer. You know, I think the first one is so crucial, and I think it's so difficult to get. I'm putting number two as U.S. Open 2022. Might be a hot take, but I just think... When you've never won a major, there's never won a major, and post you've won a major. And I think you live mentally in two completely different worlds, before and after. I think the hardest one to get is always the first. So even though the draw opened up, he in the quarterfinal, he played the epic against Yannick Sinner, but Sinner wasn't really who he is today at that point. I know neither was Alcaraz, but still, if you look at the trajectory of their development, they're closer together now than they were at that point in terms of overall level. And then he gets to play Tiafo in the semis. Fo played really well in that semi, so don't don't sleep on that win in terms of the quality for Alcaraz. Then I think the big challenge in the final was dealing with the fact of how much tennis he'd played. Holy moly, don't forget the Chilich match. That was five sets. That finished really early in the morning. So... He was really having to go into that final against Kasparud with a less than full gas tank and still win it. I'd put it that I'd put that at number two though, mostly because it's his first. It's so important to get one so you get that weight off of your shoulders. Number three, I would put this Wimbledon final against Djokovic here in 2024. The the biggest thing, yes, you you do it again, you kind of reaffirm the result from last year. You defend your title. You do it again again against Novak. You snap a two-match losing streak against Novak. But the dominance, and Steve Flink talked about that in, in our chat. He pointed that out. I hadn't really thought about it in this way yet. But the dominance of it is uncharted territory for Alcaraz. It's unlike any of the other four in the sense he really made a statement. And that statement was... I'm the much better player in this final. There's no debate about it. Number four, I'd say Roland Garros against Zverev. Obviously, it completed the, the trifecta of surfaces, but 
he, he played a great final. I, I respect Zverev a lot as an opponent, but to me, the specialness factor of that slam title compared to the other three that I think were were really, really significant in some way or another, I think the the RG final lacked that in in a certain way. And yeah, he he came back, you know, from down two sets to one, but you know, frankly, coming back against Zverev in a major final is it's almost it's almost how I would expect it to go if you're beating Zverev in a major final. I mean, that's how Team did it. That's how Medvedev did it at the Australian Open this year. That's how Fritz did it at Wimbledon this year. I mean, the easiest way to beat Zverev is to come from behind. I know that sounds weird to say, but it's kind of true. They're all great, but that would be my ranking. Next, from Rectangular Dots. Would love to hear how you rate Sinners versus Alcaraz's win against Djokovic. Pretty simple answer here, and good question. Almost an obvious question, but a, but a good one. That's why I got 30 likes. I think Djokovic played better in this Wimbledon final against Alcaraz than what he showed in Australia against Sinner. I know Novak took the third set against Sinner, he could have taken the third set against Alcaraz here if he played a better tiebreak potentially. But first two sets against Sinner, they were similarly one-sided. I think Djokovic was worse because he was missing left and right. He did not have his timing at all. He did not have his balance at all. He was a total mess in terms of his ability to execute a simple return game baseline game. He was just way off. Totally totally way off in every in every sense. I didn't feel that way in the first two sets against Alcaraz. I thought that he was tactically a little bit desperate, but if you asked Djokovic to make some returns in play or execute a very simple cross-court backhand or a cross-court forehand, he was doing it no problem. It's not like he was completely completely out of sorts in terms of his ability to execute shots, which was the case against Sinner. He couldn't make a ball. Against Alcaraz here, yeah, he he wasn't so good in certain areas, but he was he was much better. So to me, Alcaraz's win a little bit more impressive than Sinner's win. It, it comes down to, I think, Alcaraz was dealing with a slightly better version of Djokovic. Yes, even off the knee surgery. Yes. Before we go to the next question, I want to tell you guys about CoachLife.com. The traveling coaches on tour, the people who we know as the players' coaches, they are amazing at what they do. But if you were to ask me, Gil... Who are the most important coaches in the life of a professional tennis player? I would tell you unequivocally, it's the coaches that developed their games and built the foundation. CoachLife.com is a platform where these coaches that built these pros from the ground up share their developmental secrets. The coaches who sculpted the games of Sviantec, Goff, Tiafo, Kyrgios, Fritz, Sampras, Draper, Sharapova, Pagula, Paul, Roddick, Davenport, Shapovalov, they're all on there. Over 300 videos in total and more being added every month. There's so many different ways to learn from Coach Life, but I can tell you personally that recently I got off the court and just wasn't really feeling my backhand, which is kind of typical for me. My forehand is my natural side. I just let it go. I let it happen. It works. My backhand, it's a little bit more learned, and sometimes I can fall into some bad habits off of that wing because it's not as natural. So sometimes it's nice for me to drill down on my backhand technique. So I went to coachlife.com and I watched Diego Moyano. Hi, I'm Diego Moyano. I'm a former ITP player. I coach players like Tommy Paul, Riley Opelka, Francis Tiafo, Taylor Fritz. Walk through his ideal backhand technique step-by-step. Step. Grip, take backs, legs, swing path, hands, and... You know, obviously, most of these things I'm already doing because I'm a high enough level player, but it's nice to just drill down on these things and think maybe next time I go on the court, maybe focus on one thing, a swing thought that might help ease my mind and kind of correct something that maybe I'm not doing well enough on my back end. In this case, Diego talked about just loading a little bit of extra weight on the back leg so that way when you're actually 
accelerating towards the ball, you can get a nice weight transfer through the ball. Helps your balance and ultimately makes it a more stable shot. This is a great resource for coaches, parents, and players. And by clicking on the link in the description and typing the code GG, you get 15% off your subscription for the first two years with coachlife.com. From AZSL31, if you were to rank Alcaraz and Sinner's best surfaces, clay, grass, fast, hard, slow, medium, hard, how would you rank them and why? Well, for Sinner, I think the comfort level right now is highest on hard courts. He, he knows exactly what he needs to do. There are just no issues, and it's where he's had most of his success. you got to go hard court with Sinner. Uh, then I'll go grass because it takes a lot of the physicality out, and then I'll go clay. But I really don't think that there's that big a difference for Sinner, and I think increasingly there will be less and less of a difference between the surfaces because Sinner's game is going to work across all three surfaces beautifully. And I think he's got a great game for Clay. I just, as you know, based on the recent Sinner discourse, if I have an option of taking the physic the physical aspect a little bit more out of the equation, I'm going to take that every day. And that's why I'm going to put grass in front of Clay. Now for Alcaraz, I've been asked this a lot recently. It's really hard. It's really hard. And that's why I've kind of been avoiding the question because I don't feel strongly about it. Honest to God, I don't feel strongly about what Alcaraz's best surface is. And isn't that a credit to Carlos and his versatility and all the things that he can do? I mean, in a way, I like him to have more time on his forehand. I like a court that is a little more lively and bounces high. So I think he gets a little bit more out of his forehand and his kick serve. But look at Wimbledon. A little bit more low bouncing, a little bit slicker. And he can adapt to that. He can be more kind of potent offensively and his shot making can be rewarded more and he can come forward more and his approach shots are more damaging and the ball sits up for his volleys more and he can use his block return. So honestly, right now, because I don't feel strongly about it from a technical standpoint, I'm inclined to just go with where he's won the most. So I think I'll go grass first. He's got two Wimbledon titles. That's it. Right now, that's what it comes down to. And usually grass is the surface where there, there's a steeper leaning, learning curve. It takes longer to acclimate yourself because you don't get the same kind of reps in. So the fact that as a young player, he's already done what he's done is incredible. Number two, I'll put clay. And then three, I'll go hardcore. Indian Wells, slower, grittier, hard, grittier hardcore. I've absolutely loved the level that he's played at Indian Wells two years in a row. But if I can't differentiate between how the hardcourt is playing, I'll put hardcourt three for Alcaraz. Ultimately, again, the way things are going, modern play styles, well-roundedness in the modern player, and to some extent, obviously, also surface homogenization, which is for those who might not know that word, it just means sameness, surfaces getting closer together in how they play. You are going to see Alcaraz and Sinner be affected by surface within the margins, not in a really, really drastic way, but within the margins, which matters because tennis comes down to close margins all the time, but it it's not going to matter as much as sometimes we want it to, and it's not going to matter as much as it used to. Next one from user. Hey, Gilda, I just wanted to ask you about Alcaraz's focus in matches, especially during the big mom moments. For his matches against Paul, Tiafo, and Daniil, even the first, uh, the first set tie breaks against Layal and Vukic, it seemed like he was off to a slow start, not finding his serves and making many unforced errors. When he lost the first set or was losing 2-1 two and two to one against Tiafo, he seemed to find his best tennis. However, against Djokovic, he came out great from the first set with some of the best serving all tournament. Do you think the fact that he was playing a slam final against Djokovic, who had beaten him the last two times, put him in high tension mode and he was playing when he was... Oh, put him in the high tension mode that he was playing when he was down against the other players? what? Why did it take him longer to lock in in these other matches compared to the final? 
The short answer here is yes. I think that there is a high alert mode that can be initiated for Alcaraz, which he normally responds extremely well to. And not all players do. Red alert mode. I could say high alert. I could say red alert. There were moments with Tiafo where the scoreboard said red alert because you're down two sets to one. You're down love 30. That happened twice. Red alert. How do you react? And I think for, for in the case of Djokovic, it's more high alert. You must be at your best. You're playing against Novak Djokovic. You do not want to at any point let him feel like he's turned the, turned the tides. We do not we do not want to do what we did in Cincinnati. In Cincinnati, that should have been a straight set win for for Alcaraz in all likelihood. But what happened? He got a little too comfortable. He got a little careless. He thought that Djokovic was down and out because he wasn't feeling well because of the heat. And he got sloppy. And then once Djokovic was in, again, what did I say in that match? Sun went down. Djokovic went up. Now we had a battle on, on our hands. Now Alcaraz had a had a different beast to contend with. He did not want that to happen again. So do I think a major focus coming into the match was value every single point? Yes, I do. And did that have something to do with the fact that he was playing Novak? Yes, I think so. And then, you know, the other thing, first of all, I think he he improved his serving tangibly, and that helped him just, I think, stabilize in a in a much larger context. But you also got to remember about Alcaraz. He has, Andy Roddick called it, shooter's mentality. I think that was a good way to put it. And what that means is that if Alcaraz makes three unforced errors in a row, usually, not always, but usually his reaction is going to be, I'm going to play the same ball that I just missed three times in a row because I trust myself to make it the fourth time. And that's how I need to play, and that's my game, and I'm going to back myself and I'm going to trust myself. And I think the the good part about that is when it clicks, you don't give your opponent as much of a chance. You don't give your opponent the sense that, oh, I've I've shaken his confidence. Now it gives me the chance to play well, right? That's the good part about it. The bad part about it is sometimes that shooter's mentality can lead to stretches and matches where Alcaraz lets two unforced errors in a row turn into six unforced errors over the stretch of three games. And you're thinking, how do you let that happen? Like, maybe maybe play safer. Maybe, like, clearly, clearly you're a little off right now, so alter your aggressive margin. But Alcaraz doesn't like to do that. That's not what he does. So there are pros and cons to that. It's not right or wrong, but just understand what that comes with. That comes with more fluctuations in his matches. Next one is from member K Sagar. Thank you for being a member. You can hit the join button. If you would like to be a member, I try to get you in these mailbags as much as possible, regardless of the amount of likes on these comments. And obviously it is the best way to contribute to the channel. Hi, Gil. Are you concerned at all about pro tennis becoming boring if Alcaraz cleans up his game? The shot making will be a wow factor, but a consistent Alcaraz seems unbeatable. I remember the early Fed years were pretty uh, were pretty to watch, but the outcomes were never in doubt. Hmm. Uh, first of all, I understand what you're saying. You're saying, what if Alcaraz becomes a consistent player who serves great? Like, what if Alcaraz actually has a great first serve consistently? What if he just starts dominating? Okay. You know, that if, 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 if doesn't exist, in the words of Rafa Nadal, that scenario, I would have to think about that. I'm not really sure. Let me respond to this question by saying, we're a far ways off of that. I mean, Roger Federer, three years in a row, won 90% of his matches. Carlos Alcaraz has done that zero years in a row, right? I mean, this is his first two-slam year, and that's really significant. If he makes it a three-slam year at the U.S. Open, that is officially a dominant year by, by any metric. But 
let's just put it into context here. I know, I know what you're getting at, but look, Yannick Sinner is going to have a lot to say about that. And Alcaraz still has work to do to get to that point. And you just don't know what's going to happen. I don't want to put pressure on these guys, but let me main, name drop these guys. You don't know how a Jakob Mensik is going to develop over the course of the next couple of years or how a Zhao Fonseca is going to develop over the course of the next couple of years. Now, I don't see anyone who looks like young Alcaraz looked at the start of 2022 where it just seemed very obvious that there is something special happening there. But at the same time, I would just always keep in mind that development is not a given, that development is not linear, and also always keep in mind that there are always young sharks coming up, and they're going to have something to say. And Yannick Sinner, believe me, he still feels like he is going to have a whole lot to say. So I think that's the best answer to that question. Um, I, I have to think harder about if we get into that situation and even I have to think about like, what if, what if Iga starts dominating at the slams more, you know, I mean, what then? Now I think there's a pretty big difference in, I think gravitational star power pull between Alcaraz and Sviantec and that, that somewhat changes the, the uh, equation, but it's a very interesting topic. I don't know that I've fully made up my mind about where I stand on it in terms of can dominance be too dominant where it's boring in tennis. Interesting. Next one is from North. Might seem a bit dramatic, but is Alcaraz unbeatable when he plays at that level? Djokovic came in with excellent shot quality, strong serve numbers, and Alcaraz still just took him apart. Am I just overreacting, or is it a combo of redlining plus a subpar Novak? Also, I genuinely didn't think it was possible for someone of Alcaraz's size to serve like that. 136 serve bot. Oh, 136 is a serve bot. Six foot five plus speed, and he repeated it or got close consistently. Well, his average was 122, right? I'm pretty sure I'm remembering that correctly. I know I said it on Monday Match Analysis. So let's let's just uh, be clear about that. I don't agree with the assessment of the match that Djokovic played great and Alcaraz still smoked him. I don't agree with that viewpoint in the bigger, in the larger picture. I do believe it was both. I think Djokovic had the ability to bring some things to the table at a high level. Some things, but not all things. Djokovic could not really defend well in this match. He was not patient or consistent in this match. He he could not grind in this match. So it was, you know, the 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 plan was very clear. Attack, 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 attack. Come in hard down the line very early. Like aggressive returns. Really aggressive plus ones. Never never let Alcaraz feel like he's in the point whenever you land a first serve. Hit hard second serves as much as possible, which honestly I'm surprised Djokovic didn't even do a little bit more. So the way Novak went about the, the game was not, to me, a, a player who has the full capacity of what uh, they're capable of. And that's what struck me about Djokovic's performance. It wasn't like, wow, Novak can't hit a ball. Like, Novak isn't serving. Novak can't make a return. Novak can't make a simple shot. And that's what it was in Australia, and that goes back to the earlier mailbag question where I, I think Alcaraz's win was a little bit more impressive than Sinner's win. Um because I thought Djokovic just couldn't do anything in Australia. Everything was bad. And here, I didn't think it was like that. But I thought it was a, a very incomplete a very incomplete version of Djokovic. And then Alca Alcaraz was incredible. So I do think it was a combination. Incredible Alcaraz. Meh. Less than stellar Djokovic. Kind of a kind of a strange version of Djokovic who just wasn't able to really defend at all against Alcaraz's firepower. Um, and, and by the way, had the mindset of a player who doesn't believe that they have the ability to defend. It's not like Djokovic tried and failed to defend, although obviously there were patches and certain points where that occurred. But it was someone who, from the very start of the match, didn't believe they could defend and then also really struggled to defend when they were forced to. 
Anyway, I guess you're, the original part of the question is, is Alcaraz unbeatable when he plays at that level? And I would say, let's, I, I'm really careful with that word. You know, nobody's really ever unbeatable. And I don't think this was very good evidence or proof that Alcaraz is unbeatable. Look, Alcaraz was losing sets throughout the tournament. At Roland Garros, he was pushed to five by Sinner. He was pushed to five by Zverev. So let's not act like he's tearing through everybody like it's easy. It, it's not easy for him. And he did just have a stretch where he struggled. That said, I also, if, you, if you're saying when Alcaraz is at the peak of his performance, is he the best? I do believe when he is at his peak right now, from everything I've seen, I believe he's the best. But there's a difference between that and unbeatable. All right, next one is from Sarajantas. Do you think Alcaraz is capable of beating Djokovic's Grand Slam record? Seems like he doesn't have many opponents right now. I don't know if I agree with that. Also, he has great qualities as a player. He's complete, hardworking, and willing to work on adjustments. I'm kind of afraid that he's basing his game on physicality and movement, just like Nadal at the beginning of his career, so there's a high risk of injuries and overall health issues. Do you see possible troubles with his body, just like Nadal? Do you see any precautions to improve his longevity as a tennis player? Well, to, to answer first the second part, and then I'll get to the first part, there have been a lot of different sorts of injuries, and I think a level of concern for those injuries is appropriate. I don't think I'm as concerned as maybe Steve Flink is when, when we've discussed the topic. I think I'm a little bit lower on the scale. But it certainly registers on the concern meter. I wouldn't compare him to young Nadal because Alcaraz, Alcaraz is not looking to do as much running as young Nadal was looking to do. Uh, he's much more attacking. He is much more inclined to look to finish points on his terms. And I would make that very clear distinction. Now, as far as the first thing, the first part of your comment here, do you think Alcaraz is capable of beating Djokovic's Grand Slam record? I want to be very care I want to be very clear here. I said last year I believe it was last year. I said the big three records, all of them, and their slam counts, they will not last another 50 years. They will all be surpassed. And it was a statement that it got aggregated a little bit. Uh, people kind of, it, it sounded surprising. It sounded a little bit shocking. I'm in, I'm in the same place. I think uh, not to diminish the greatness of what all of them have accomplished with Djokovic at the top of that having won the most. Um, there are reasons why they were able to dominate at the level that they dominated, okay? The level of all-surface success, all-encompanying success across the surfaces, that is the new normal. That is the new normal. Athletes performing at a very, very high level through their mid-30s, that is the new normal. We have not just seen this in tennis. We've seen this across sports. So if being able to win all four majors and being able to play until your mid-30s, if both of those things are going to be the norm, you have to wake up and smell the roses and understand that there are reasons why the big three were able to accomplish what they did other than other than the explanation that I've normally heard from other people, which is miraculously, by some incredible coincidence, the three greatest players in the history of tennis were all born at the same time. Because that's what everybody likes to say, and it's a great story. It sounds awesome. It sounds really fun. And this is not to diminish them. They are all absolutely beyond words when it comes to how much reverence I have for the three of them. Beyond words. 
but what they accomplished numerically and statistically will be surpassed within the next 50 years because the conditions at which they did what they did are going to continue to be the conditions. And the conditions enabled them in a, in a lot of ways to do what they did. So do I think Alcaraz is capable? Yes, I do. I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but yes, I think Alcaraz is capable. All right, next one is from Sports Fan. It's our first one from Discord. Hi, Gil. Do you think the Wimbledon 2024 final has serious implications in terms of the future of Novak Djokovic's career moving forward? I understand he is coming off of an arthroscopic knee surgery and almost didn't play Wimbledon at all. But can this straight sets beatdown be a sign that his body is slowing down and that the young guys are catching up? After all, this is around the same age when Federer and Nadal started to break down physically. Even before the knee was an issue, he seemed to be having the worst season of his career in a long time and also looks to be lacking motivation in tournaments other than the slams, and in this case, the Olympics. Could you see a situation where he plays the Olympics and seriously reconsiders his career moving forward? You know, good question. Really hard to say. What Novak has said is that he has no plans to stop. I a thousand percent believe him. I don't think there's anything in his head right now that says, I want to stop or that I'm going to stop. But as we've seen with Federer and Nadal, plans to stop doesn't always pan out. Meaning Nadal didn't have plans to stop. Federer didn't have plans to stop. Their bodies at a certain point said, no mas, and they were forced to stop. And usually one of two things happens in a, in a career. Either the body gets to a point where you can't do it anymore, injuries force you out, or losing forces you out. Now, for the vast majority of players, that means that they can't play the big events anymore. So let's take Benoit Paire, for example. Benoit Paire, I believe he's 35 years old. This week, he dropped outside of the top 200. He might have to stop because I've actually been surprised with how willing Benoit has been to play challengers. But it's one thing if you're knocking on the door and you're between 100 and 200 and you're playing some challengers, but you're you're right in the zone where you can just kind of leap up if you have a couple of big results and now you're back playing the Masters and the Slams, which is ultimately why a player like Benoit Paire still does it. Uh, but that would be an example. Like Benoit might need to stop if he doesn't start winning. Maybe maybe he can have a big week here in Newport and turn things things around. Just an example. Now, for Novak, the thing is, that equation is completely different for him. His version of, oh, I'm losing too much, is completely different than Benoit Paire's version of, I'm losing too much. Or even like Stan Wawrinka's version of, I'm losing too much. And I don't have a great argumentation to really tell you why I feel like Novak is not going to be pulling a Stan Wawrinka or an Andy Murray. But I just don't quite see it. And maybe I'll be wrong. Because again, I don't have a lot of concrete argumentation to back this up. But I just don't think Novak is going to have a lot of interest in playing if he can't, if he doesn't feel like he can contend for big titles. So I believe that there is a clock on it where if and look, I, I think he's going to be resilient. I don't think he's going to quit easily or give up easily the hopes of getting to the highest level, which he hasn't been able to do so far in 2024. So I don't see this happening after the Olympics this year. I think that's far too soon. But maybe at this time next year, if he hasn't, if, if nothing has happened that has given him the requisite belief necessary where he feels like he can contend for majors. I do think that maybe his plans of playing a few more years, those plans might be disrupted based on his ability to win consistently. So that's my answer to the question, right? I don't know, but I think there is a serious threat there. And I think there's a clock on how long Djokovic is willing to go without winning the biggest tournaments, winning the biggest matches. And right now, we are on, he was just in a major final, which, 
yes, that's something. But we are on about six months here where he hasn't won the biggest matches. I'm going to try to start going a little bit quicker for the next, maybe I'll get 10 more in. I pulled 32 questions, which was ambitious to say the least. Next one from SJ. Hi, Gil. Do you think Novak's commitment to serve and volley and net rushing because of was because of fear of injury due to the Olympics around the corner? Or is it possible he genuinely believed he had no shot of matching Alcaraz from the baseline and chose to commit to this game plan? I just can't imagine why he'd think this was the right play. Alcaraz is an insane returner and hugs the baseline, making him pretty difficult to net rush. And he's extremely fast on defense as well. I would have expected Djokovic to at least try moving back and playing more baseline tennis at some point. So to the first theory, I would reject that pretty vehemently. When you are in a Wimbledon final, when number 25 is on the line and you are three sets away from winning your 25th major, it's balls to the walls. To the I don't know why I pluralized walls there. It's balls to the wall. You don't you don't worry at that point. I mean, especially you have six matches under your belt. You've, you've tested the knee. You're not saving for the Olympics at that point. You're going for the Wimbledon title. So I don't think that had to do with it at all. Um, I think most of it was, yes, feeling that he couldn't hang with Alcaraz from the back because he wasn't, he was intimidated by Alcaraz's attacking against his movement and he did not back his movement to have any success there. But also, I think it would be important to note that Alcaraz was, A, chipping returns, and B, frustrating Djokovic when he did stay back with the chipped return. So I would have to go back to those early serve and volleys in that first game and maybe maybe take a closer look on exactly how Alcaraz returned the first uh, return serve on the first few points of the match. But it's usually not a terrible idea when your opponent is blocking returns back to serve and volley against that. But I think the court position becomes very, very important in that case. Are they blocking from really far up on the baseline? Because if that's the case, serve and volleying might still be difficult, even if they're blocking. Uh, But if they're blocking from a little bit further back, that I think becomes pretty prime serve and volley meat. And ultimately, part of it also may have come down to the problem for Djokovic. Part of it may have come down to uh, predictability, where it seemed like on a couple, Alcaraz was very much expecting it, very much saw him coming. And there started to, didn't you start to feel in the air that Djokovic was coming in and serving volleying because he started to do it so much? And that, I think, contributed to the quality of return from Alcaraz on a lot of them because he just wasn't ever caught off guard by it from the very start. It's interesting, though. I guess no one asked Djokovic that in the post-match press conference. Pretty obvious question to ask, but I don't think he got asked that. From Surio, I'm going to just skip the top part for time. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Since the beginning of getting into tennis, I have seen an X in YouTube and now here in the Discord the discussion on whether the wins from guys like Alcaraz and Sinner should have an asterisk because of this is is a, quote, weak era. The big three were extraordinary and definitely deserve admiration, but it seems unfair to undervalue Alcaraz and Sinner's victories just because they aren't playing against them. Nadal, Djokovic, and Federer were simply out of this world, and Carlitos and Yannick are not to blame or to be underrated for having appeared at this moment and not before. What is your take on this? Do you think the titles won by Carlitos and Yannick carry less weight than those by the big three? If they by any chance get to reach 20 slams, should their titles be valued equally? I believe they should, but perhaps I might be biased since I didn't fully experience the big three era as a fan. Again, thanks for all your work and sorry for my English writing from Spain. Shout out Spain and no worries about your English. Totally A-OK on that front. Pretty good, actually. So I think... This is all prisoner of the moment stuff. It's important to realize that building up a reputation in tennis takes a lot of time because we count in tennis. It's a numbers game. How many times have you finished number one? How many slams have you won? How many titles have you won? So nobody is considered great really quickly. It always takes time. 
Alcaraz and Sinner, what are they, 10% done with their careers? The, the next 90% is still ahead? Who knows how we're going to look at what these... We don't know what the era is in, in five years from now, what their main rivals are, what the young players are going to do. That and we, we likely will see Sinner as a great. Right now, we don't. Why? One slam. Zero year-end number ones. He doesn't have the counting numbers. That doesn't mean that we won't look back when he does have the counting numbers. We won't look back at 2024 Yannick Sinner as a great. At 2025 Yannick Sinner as a great. Because, again, these things, it takes time for the reputation of a tennis player to catch up with how good they really are. Or, in this case, how good they really were. It's so premature to be assessing this era and how strong slash weak it was. Not to mention, Alcaraz and Sinner have had to deal with a really good version of Novak Djokovic. Really good. He had a great year last year. I don't care that he was 36. He was playing great tennis. Believe your eyes. Believe what your eyes saw. I saw a terrific Novak Djokovic. So that's what it was. We don't need to be a prisoner of the fact that he was 36 and then say, oh, it was easy to beat Novak Djokovic in 2023. It wasn't. I was there. I watched. It wasn't easy. He was great. Next one from Finney. Hey, Gil, I wanted to ask you about the injuries on grass. I could be wrong, but it felt like this year there were so many slips and injuries throughout the grass season with Dimitrov, Zverev, Raducanu, and many others either taken out or significantly hampered by injuries on the grass courts. And for me, it was a pretty big story of Wimbledon. I know the program, the pro game has gotten much faster and more physical. So what are some solutions that you would pose to make the game a little safer and limit injuries on that surface in particular? Appreciate the kind words on the bottom there. Well, a couple of things have happened. One, it used to be legal to have spuds on the sides of the shoe, on the sides of the grass court shoe. So if you look at the bottom of a grass court shoe, what does it look like? How, how can I describe this? You know how a, a ping pong paddle, not, not, one of the really, not one of the ones that real professionals use, which are tacky and smooth. But one of the table tennis paddles that you'll see in, in somebody's basement or in a more recreational setting where it has almost pimples on them or dimples. No, pimples would be the right word. That's what the bottom of a grass court tennis shoe looks like. There's pimples. It used to be legal to have pimples on the side of the shoe. And they felt it was tearing up the grass too much. So they made it illegal. Screw the grass. Bring back the pimples. Is that going to become like a meme? I feel like it was that was a really bizarre thing to say. Anyway, that's one thing. Uh, second thing that the players all want are the balls to stay consistent. So I don't, I don't see, I don't hear any complaints about uh, the Slashinger balls that Wimbledon uses. It's actually the oldest sponsorship in all of tennis is Wimbledon and Slashinger, which has been like over a hundred years. So. You have that layer to it. But ultimately, that's the one thing that I think all the players are looking at to try to reduce injuries. Then the third thing is schedule. So those are the solutions that I see right now. Next one is from Member A Mugs Game. Remember when you ranked Krejcikova below the likes of Kenan, Ostapenko, Stevens, and Vondrosova when I asked you to rank all of the one slam winners in the women's game since 2013? You put all those women in a tier above her on the basis that they had at least a slam winning level, while you put Barbora in the bottom tier alongside the likes of Raducanu, saying that she belongs in the more random slam winner category. I'm paraphrasing a little. Now that she is the first of all those players to win a second slam, can you go into more detail about why you felt she belonged in the bottom tier below some of the names that even before this Wimbledon had probably achieved less in singles than Barbora anyway? Uh, before this, Wimbledon, Barbora had seven singles titles, one slam, one Masters, two 500s, and had at least quarterfinal at all the other slams, and has beaten Peak Sviantek in a final, not once, but twice in the past couple years. I know Ostrava, but I'm not remembering the second one. 
Have you changed your mind about her, or do you believe that Pete Krejcikova is still truly not uh, elite due to certain limitations in her game or otherwise? Would you be in- would be interested to hear you dissect the strengths and weaknesses of her game in more detail? I'll let you do that part. But one thing that stands out about Krejcikova to me is that she seems to believe she can beat anyone. She seems to have the mentality of a champion. Look, she proved me wrong, right? That's Let's just get that part out of the way. I remember this. This is actually one of the things I was thinking about a lot as I was watching Krejcikova make this run is that I ranked her very low. There were some people who said I ranked her too low. I, I do think that there is like numerical stuff that I could lean on. It wasn't just me and my like weird. Uh, anyway, like for example, 20, I mean, uh, two top 20 finishes in her career. Only two. Because remember, she's a late bloomer. Then she got hot, and then she fell off a little bit, and then she she got hot again post U.S. Open, and I just never really loved that as much, so I didn't put as much weight into that probably. So, you know, and then she finished that year number ten. So she she only has two top twenty finishes in her in her career, and she's I want to say she's twenty eight. Um, so it, you know, I do think that there was something to it, but at the end of the day, she proved me wrong by winning, and she yeah, she is twenty eight. Um, she proved me wrong by doing what she, what she, uh, what she did at Wimbledon. And I think the answer is she's more well-rounded than most of the players on this list or more solid mentally. I guess if you go through it one, one by one, uh, Kenan, I think her biggest edge would be mental. Ostapenko, her biggest edge would be movement and athleticism, well-roundedness. Uh, Stevens, her biggest edge would be mental. Vondrosova, her biggest edge would be Offensive baselining, ball striking. Uh, but a lot of, you know, Kennan, Ostapenko, Stevens, Vondrosova, they do a couple things at a really spectacular level. And that almost made me, I think, was the main thing why I placed them above Krejcikova. I think Barbora does more things at a better level, which might not be as sexy. But is probably more effective in terms of her ability to move decently well, to have attacking weapons enough. It's not, it's not Ostapenko level, but it's enough to combine that with some D with some movement. It's not Von Drosova level, but it's enough. You see what I mean here? She is more well-rounded than those players. And to me, that's how she separates herself from them. And the main reason why she was able to win a second slam and uh, she's she's highly professional, and I, I like her mentally. I'm not going to say that like the key to her success is uh, belief because I don't really know what that means. Like belief has to. I've never said that in my analysis of a player ever that the key to their success is belief. Belief has to come from ability. It, it always comes from ability. It always comes from preparation, from confidence in in the skills that you've developed, in the fitness that you have, right. Joe Schmo can go in there and have belief. It's just not going to happen. So um, sometimes I can talk about mental game as a great strength, like I did for Paolini. I don't think it's as big of a factor for Krejcikova. I think she's got a great mental game that doesn't hold her back. But I would say the well-roundedness of her skills and her smooth and clean ball striking are the main things that make her stand out. From Medox, Maddox Goons. Hey, Gil, first of all, I want to thank you for the great coverage week in and week out. Do you think players should be able to take a break when they're tired? Sinner stopped for almost 10 minutes against Medvedev because he was exhausted and felt dizzy. For me, this was thanks to the game style slash plan of Medvedev. If you let him take such a long break because he can't handle Medvedev's game, you take away a big part of the advantage that Medvedev gets playing this way. And I don't think that is fair. I'm a huge fan of Sinner, and it's not his fault he was allowed to stop for this long. But I feel like the rules don't respect the effects that Daniil's game brings. Uh, excuse me if there are some mistakes, but English isn't my first language. All good, all good. So, look, this is this is valid question. I think I actually saw something when I was commentating on my match today that I thought was interesting. Hamad Majedovic was really struggling physically, and he was actually down break point. He said, "I have to stop." He got blood pressure banned. Pulse checked, uh, so clearly he wasn't, I think he was feeling lightheaded, would be my guess. 
but certainly he was feeling unwell and it wasn't a physical pain. It was, it was more, it was more not feeling well, right? He was down break point and he stopped and he came back, saved the break point. I think he won the deuce point and jogged to his towel box and it was like a, you know, five, five minute break. Clearly he recovered during the medical timeout. He ended up holding serve. Tsitsipas won the match anyway. But I was like, oh, wow, that's kind of questionable. Clearly, he recovered because of the medical timeout. We're in a difficult spot, though, because we don't want players fainting. Like, if Sinner feels dizzy, we don't really want him. I don't think we necessarily want him playing through that and fainting. Nobody wants that. Ultimately, what we want is both players to be healthy, feeling well enough to play. That's the best product that's the best entertainment value and i think that's how we want tennis matches to go i think there needs to be a balance stopping during a game to me is probably over the line and i think in majedovic's situation he should have forfeited the game he should have the rules should have dictated that he forfeits the game that didn't rub me right right you're down break point you're not feeling well. You're going to take the medical time out, recover, save the break point, hold serve, and, and now we're going to go from there. That just didn't feel right to me. But Sinner doing it at a break, uh, that is a little bit different. Obviously, he did it at a changeover. The fact that it took 10 minutes, you could look at that and question that. But I think what happened, we don't know because it was off court. We didn't see it. The fact that it was 10 minutes was because the the clock starts when treatment begins. The rule is you get three minutes for treatment. But in the time that the doctor is evaluating your condition, that's unlimited time. It's up to the doctor to tell the chair umpire, okay, the evaluation period is over. That's when the three minutes start when it's time for treatment. So the fact that it took 10 minutes had to do with uh, was really at the discretion of the doctor and the physio there, not exactly Yannick's fault. But that doesn't really take away from the question of should it ever take 10 minutes and is that okay? And apparently Sinner was at his worst when he went off court, probably feeling very lightheaded, probably feeling very weak. This is a tough spot. What do we do? I would like tennis to to be a little bit more strict about when these timeouts are taken. Um, and, and for what? So I don't like middle of the game. And then also what could be implemented is, uh, you know, if you were to say, Yannick, you can have an extra three minutes, but you lose the next game or something like that. And then it's, then it's, you can get the treatment that you need. Obviously we, we don't want to deprive players of that, but there is a consequence when it comes to loss of physical condition in this case. So this is a, I don't know that I have this fully figured out. And I would expect the status quo to remain the same, which is that you kind of err on the side of players are able to get treatment. You hope they don't abuse the system. The system is abused all the time. Everybody on tour knows it. It's basically accepted across the tour that uh, players abuse medical timeouts all the time. I think it's very hard to, to put into place policy that prevents taking advantage of the system, that doesn't end up coming across as cruel and unreasonable in an individual sport where there are no substitutions. A couple more here. From Chav Darnikolev, should Medvedev have been defaulted in the semifinal for saying to the umpire, F you, F you, F you, you piece of shit? Andy Roddick says that this is the only reason. Oh, Andy Roddick says the only reason he wasn't was because it will hurt the viewership. I agree with Andy in one way. I think that if if Daniil was playing like a challengers match, or if maybe he was on court 18 in the first round, the the chances he would have been defaulted were pretty decent. Although I think in general. It's hard to get defaulted on the first time. Like, obviously, the the leaning is to first give a warning. And I think the reason the warning system is in place is because an immediate default for anything is just a lot. I mean, there's a lot on the line here. And personally, 
I'm good with the warning because I think players kind of deserve, uh, hey, one more time and you're out kind of thing. Uh, now, sometimes I think there's too much leniency with the system that is currently in place where it's warning, loss of, uh, loss of one point, and then it's a default. Sometimes that can be too much leniency. But I'm kind of pro-warning in general, especially when you're not endangering people. It is just words. I really don't approve of it at all. I don't want to... I don't want to get my words twisted whatsoever. And I, I think Medvedev, this happens far too often with Daniil. I would like him to fix it. It's unacceptable how often he acts this way towards umpires. And it's uh, an unattractive quality that, that Daniil possesses. Uh, he is, it's not the first time that he's been pretty vicious, pretty personal, pretty direct with umpires got to stop but it, it comes down to the last question as well individual sport really tough to pull the plug and to when you take a player out of an individual sport you lose the entire product so you're never going to put systems in place where we we find ourselves in that position on a frequent basis we're always going to try to avoid that next one from yannick murray Hey, Gil, wanted to ask you about Musetti. Earlier in the season, you said he needed to improve his serve and forehand to have success away from Clay. Do you feel that this grass season was caused by that? Where do you see him as going into the hardcourt season? Someone who can push for the top 10? Or will he go back to struggling? I think it'll probably be somewhere in between, and I think that would be a, an appropriate outcome for Musetti. I, I think he'll always prefer the natural surfaces. I think there are good reasons for it. On the grass, mostly comes down to slice effectiveness and block return effectiveness, and therefore the effectiveness of his defense. But also it gives him a little help in areas where he might be a little underpowered. So I think it's important to note that sometimes players who don't have all that you know, who don't have huge muscle on the serve but hit their spots can turn into much better servers on the grass. I think Musetti probably falls into that category. Then on clay, there's, you know, it's other stuff. He gets the extra time. He gets to use the the different heights and spins effectively. And he, he obviously gets to be really difficult to hit through as he is on all surfaces. But on, on clay, it accentuates that strength. In terms of his Wimbledon success, I think it was a little bit of everything because I did see some serve plus one, but I don't think that was the main thing. Again, defense, slice effectiveness, uh, consistency, rally tolerance, variety, and matchups. I think he is a matchup nightmare for certain players. If you are not willing to play extra balls, if you are not willing to finish at net, if you are not a clinical attacker, that's where he gives you a ton of trouble, and he kept facing those kinds of opponents. That's why I predicted him. Think about it this way. Lorenzo Musetti was not in my Wimbledon power rankings, wasn't even in my honorable mentions, I don't think, but I picked him to the quarterfinal because I thought his matchups were so favorable. And luckily this time, I nailed it. So, but that gives you kind of also a window that I, I think that played into it. All right, let's do, let's do a couple more so painful to uh to choose you know a select few questions because there are always so many good ones all right this one's from arm leg hi gil my question today is about Sviantec at wimbledon you've discussed already how certain factors about her game and grass courts negatively impact her success on the surface however something that i find interesting is that her last three wimbledon losses have not come against a playing style you would expect to fully exploit this Cornet in 22, Svitolina in 23, and now Putin Seva in 2024. All players who I would generally cl classify as counterpunchers, or at the very least, players who lack the type of firepower that you'd think can take the racket out of Iga's hands. We know that on hard court, and to a much lesser extent clay court, power players like Ostapenko, Rybakina, Savalenka, etc. can damage Sviantec. Do you think that the profile of the opponents that are beating Sviantec at Wimbledon is so different because the grass surface has lowered the threshold of power required to create the same Sviantec versus power player effect, or is it a different dynamic completely? I think it's a, it's mostly a different dynamic completely. 
I mean, I do think that Putin Seva was aggressive and that she was pretty unsettling with how big she was hitting off the ground at times combined with her drop shots. And, you know, Svitolina was hitting the forehand big last year, no doubt. But mostly it's been erratic performances from Sviantek that I think have to do mostly with herself and uh, less so the opponent, I, I, I have to say. And I think there's been a severe lack of confidence on the grass. You know, this year she comes off the court and she says that she didn't have enough rest after Roland Garros and that she wouldn't make that mistake again, right? So clearly she felt like internally things weren't right for her. And I think that continues to happen time and time again. So she needs to look hard at her preparation and she needs to figure out a way to kind of figure out a way to, I guess, feel her best physically and mentally at Wimbledon because I don't think she's been there. I know that sounds crazy to say, but I just don't believe, and maybe in the long term I'll be proven wrong, but I just can't explain what her performances have looked like. I can't let, I can't allow the grass to completely explain that. They have been too far off from what Iga is capable of, even on a, on a slick, low-bouncing hardcore. I know that grass isn't always completely the same, but I just think it's been so extreme, you know, Iga's erratic ways on the grass. It's been so extreme that I can't just say that the grass explains it all. I can't. Last one from Hardy Har. Hey Gil, are we at a point where any speculation that a major draw could be wide open is effectively dead? Something that I noticed about the major draws from 2024 thus far was that there are only two players who have only made one major semifinal, Rude and Musetti. Everyone else who has made major semifinals have made multiple, Alcaraz, Sinner, Djokovic, Medvedev, and Zverev. And none of these have failed to make a fourth round or quarterfinal in the case of Alcaraz, Sinner, and Djokovic. Have we reached a level of consistency at the top of the men's game where we shouldn't expect to see anyone outside those five win a major for the foreseeable future? I'm always a little bit cautious about how absolute I am about it, but essentially if I, I'm picking up what you're putting down and I have always been dubious and skeptical of the idea that we're heading into a era where slams are going to be up for grabs for more players because I always backed the level that I was seeing from a young Alcaraz. And like that had overlap when, when Nadal was still, when Nadal and Djokovic were still the best players in the world in 2022. And, you know, I already saw that Alcaraz was going to be a problem for everybody else. I already saw that Medvedev on, on hard courts was going to continue to be a menace. So I never saw the whole wide open thing. And I think, yes, this last channel double, Musetti is the only surprising semifinalist we've seen, period. The only one. I'm with you. I don't see a path to wide openness. I think Alcaraz is too good. I think Sinner is too good. I think Zverev to a certain extent, maybe up until the nerves come, come and get him at the very, very end, I think Zverev's too good. I think Medvedev is too good, probably on not only just hard court now, but also grass. I'm not liking the prospects of an Andrei Rublev to win a major. I'm just not. I know this is a bad time to say that. Rublev is really in the dumps right now. But pretend Rublev was being the same consistent Andre Rublev that consistently makes quarterfinals and finishes in the top eight. I'm not confident in that guy winning a major. I'm not confident if Matteo Berrettini re-enters the top 10 and plays like he did in 2021, I'm not confident that he can steal a major. I think the top is too good. Yes, I do. All right. I'm out of gas. I've enjoyed this. It was fun. Uh, I know there is a ton of Sinner Alcaraz. That's how it is. If you had questions about other players, make sure to remember what you asked. Maybe do a little bit of copy pasting. Throw it in there again next week. I never mind if you repeat questions. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.